My name is Prash Naik. I'm the controller of legal compliance at Channel 4. And this session, which is going to run at about 90 minutes, is called Drugs, Thugs and Gypsy Burnouts. And um, it's quite an interactive session, so um, you won't be allowed to sit there passively. You will have to actually get involved a bit. Um, and I'll explain more in a little minute. <clears throat> Um, the thesis of this session is to debate whether factual programming has plundered so heavily from controversial subjects that actually we're suffering from taboo fatigue. And then on the reverse of that, to explore whether there are some classic social taboos which factual programming have attempted to deal with, but actually they sort of tread around the edges and tiptoe unsuccessfully. And we're going to look at sort of modern day examples. But before we start, I have a distinguished panel of combination of commissioners, program makers, uh, on-screen and off-screen commentators who are going to help me contribute to the debate. Um, in addition, at certain points, I'm going to ask the audience for their views. So don't feel shy if you want to ask questions. Um, if, you, if I don't see you, put your hand up and I will come over and get a microphone to basically have a chat with you and give your views. So in the great tradition of factual programming, I'm going to ask each of the panel to introduce themselves in under a minute which I'm going to strictly observe. So I'll start with Roy Ackerman. Uh, I'm the managing director of Fresh One, which is the company originally founded by Jamie Oliver. Uh, we do things like um, Jamie Oliver's Food Revolution, uh, Dream School, and back in the day, I used to make films, including, um, we made a film called Volvo City, which is all about the Orthodox Jews of Stanford Hill. It wasn't big and it wasn't fat, but there were some weddings. And um, actually, there were some fat. Um, and uh, I've made programs across a range of genre from fact and documentary and a um, bit of drama. Thank you. Emma? Um, I'm Emma Cooper. Ooh. Um, and I'm a series producer and director at the BBC. And I've been Louis Theroux's series uh, producer for about three or four years, um, directing a lot of his output. Most recently, I did a two-parter from uh, Miami Mega Jail which had its moments that were quite interesting. Um, so that's me. <laughs> Alison. Uh, I'm Alison Walsh. I'm the disability exec at Channel 4. Um, I, do, I haven't got the skills to make programs and commission programs, but I've been very privileged to work with a lot of um, great program makers on uh, disability programs. And I've sort of seen it as my job to free up minds, really, um, in commissioning, in production, and legal and compliance, and show disability in all its gory, fat glory. Lovely. So those are the producers and the commissioners. Now to our on-screen talent and off-screen commentators. Lucille? <laughs> Can you tell this is that section? <laughs> Hi. Um, I'm Lucille Howe, and um, I mainly write for, for the women's press. I um, have done for the last 20 years. So I used to be features editor on Cosmopolitan magazine and write for Marie Claire and Time Style and all sorts. Um, I also took up... Um, burlesque dancing about five years ago, much to the consternation of my parents. So also, um, I'm a part-time dancer and lecturer on that subject under the name of Honey DeVille. And um, don't Google it now from your iPhones. <laughs> this really undermine my contribution. Um, and lastly, I've just finished my first novel, which has been optioned for a film by the finances of the, finances of the King's Speech called Bondi Blonde. So that's in progress at the moment. Over to Dave. Oh, hello. I'm Dave Lynn. I'm Jewish, gay, left-handed Gemini, and surprise, surprise, I'm a drag queen. And um, I work in clubs and pubs. A couple of them you may know, The Rover's Return and The Queen Vic. I've done TV, theatre, pantomime films. My relationship with the reality TV came about when I mentored a, an ex-naval officer to be a drag queen in four weeks in the award-winning series from Channel 4, Faking It. Uh, the other thing is one of my greatest night, uh, thrills was being a mentor on Big Brother Panto. And my Dave Lynn is my name. <laughs> and last but not least, Julian. Hi, um, I'm Julian Bennett. Um, I came to fame in a show called Queer Eye for a Straight Guy. <clears throat> I've had a up and down career from being the camp outrageous one on TV to being quite serious at times. So I'm hoping to be quite serious and throw in a bit of camp today. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I've had quite a few shows on the Beeb and on uh, Channel 5, ITV1, I did a show called Help My Dogs As Fat As Me. Uh, it was a weight loss program for people with overweight 
protect uh, dogs and themselves as well. It was quite... It was not, I, I lived in Leeds for three months. It was pretty scary in itself, really. Um, and my most recent triumph, I wouldn't even call it a triumph, called Car Crash TV. I was in The Only Way is Essex. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. So this is our esteemed panel. So we're going to start mm -hmm. by assessing where your limitations as an audience and indeed the panel who are also going to participate in this game. So I'd like everyone else in the room to stand up, including the panel. Now, this is a very, very simple game, and the, the basis of this game is you have to respond honestly. Um, the aim of the game is not to be the last person standing, there are no prizes. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically, one by one, describe various factual programming scenarios. Some are real and some are made up, but I'm not going to tell you until the end. And I want you to imagine that you're sitting at home with your loved one, on your own, with your family, watching the program, and I'll give you a little bit of detail. And if you find what I'm describing as objectionable, for whatever reason, I want you to sit down. So if you're happy with what I'm saying, remain standing. If you feel that you are uncomfortable in any way, sit down, and then we'll have a little chat at the end of that. So does anyone not understand the rules? <laughs> so the general rule is, if you're unhappy, sit down when I describe something. Okay, let's start. <clears throat> so you're at home, it's seven o'clock in the evening, you're watching the news, and you're shown footage filmed on a mobile phone of what is alleged to be the execution of prisoners of war by Sri Lankan government forces. Now, to be clear, you're shown stills of the before and after pictures of an execution squad. Anyone feel that's unduly graphic for 7 p.m.? Panel all happy? Oh, blimey, people sitting down already, okay. Uh, it's now eight o'clock in the evening. A woman who is a Muslim convert, hidden behind a veil so her identity cannot be seen, talks about the killing of Osama bin Laden, and she says that she supports his ideology. Does anyone feel that that is inappropriate for that time slot? Thank you. Eight o'clock, uh, a program examining interracial prejudice between ethnic groups is entitled, Who Are You Calling a Nigger? Anyone unhappy with that? 9 p.m., it's a program now looking at the work of the police force, and it features a criminal, who I should stress is behind bars, rapping about how much he hates the police and how he will seek retribution by raping the wives of police officers. We're still at 9 o'clock, and it's a program about examining parental abuse by children, of, of, sorry, of children by their parents, and it shows some covert surveillance footage of what purports to be a mother trying to smother her baby as the baby struggles. Anyone unhappy with that? Okay. Some of us still standing, okay. 9 p.m., a young heroin addict is shown shooting up on camera. Sorry, what time is that? 9 p.m.? 9 p.m. Okay. 10 o'clock, so we're now well past the watershed. A Chinese performance artist is discussing how his rather unique form of art is uh, all the controversy in China, and it features stills of his performance in which he purports to eat parts of a stillborn baby. Oh. 10 o'clock, still at 10 o'clock. A program about the life of a male prostitute includes a scene in which I stress you hear, but don't see, a man being fisted. <laughs> okay. Seriously? And the last one, 10 o'clock, a man talks about his moments of intimacy with the love of his life who he calls Pixel. Pixel turns out not to be his wife, but the family pony. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. You can all sit down now. Okay, now in actual fact, all of those examples are real programs. They are real documentaries that have been broadcast on Channel 4 over the past seven to eight years. Now, to be fair, I haven't given you the context, but what it's an <coughs> illustration of is that we all have um, parameters under which we think is acceptable or not acceptable, and we also exercise the right to turn off the television if we feel it's inappropriate. Now, could I ask a couple of people who stood down quite early? I think you did, sir. I think you sat down at the execution video at the beginning. Did you, how did you feel about that? Uh, I just thought it was a, a bit too early because I, I could imagine myself at a younger age seeing those images, not really choosing for it. And uh, yeah, that would haunt me, I guess. And it's not like in a safe environment. If it's reality, it's okay. But if it's not in a, shown in a sort of safe environment, I would be shocked. 
Are you more concerned for yourself or for children? Well, I see myself as a child, so it's for children. Okay. Not, if I would see it right now, it wouldn't Can I ask be... how old you are, just out of interest? <laughs> I'm not a child. No, I'm, no, tw I'm <laughs> 12. <laughs> I'm 12. I'm you are over 18, yeah, please tell well, me. That. I'm 28. That's fine. Thank you. Right, and uh, can I ask a couple of people who remain standing in the audience to the bitter end? I, I, sorry, I didn't catch... I think you did. Can I ask that lady there if she could... Why did you stay standing for so long? Do you think anything goes on television? I think you need to know about the context. Agreed. And I'd, mm. I'd like to have the choice that I choose what, what I watch mm. and what I don't. So you think, in a sense, freedom of choice subject to appropriate boundaries and flagging to viewers? Yes, I do. Great. Thank you. Let me ask a couple of the panel. Now, Dave, I think you sat down at... Right, nigger. nigger. Yes. What, what's your feeling? And this, this, is, this is a nine o'clock, this is an eight o'clock program. I think mm. I may have got the timing slightly really wrong there, but do you think that's not it acceptable not, at that time? It was nine, wasn't it? Yeah. Sorry. Do you think it's ex unacceptable at that time, or is it the use of the word that you It's the word. To? I think the word is horrible. I think to put anyone uh, like Jew Boy or stuff like that, to title a program like that would put me off watching it anyway. Okay. So I, and I always, I remember when I was young, I think people used to go, oh, if you call him a nigger, you'll upset them. So I always hated the word nigger. Roy? Well, we made that show. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was, a bit of a set, that was a bit of a set up because I didn't know we, that. We made two of them. You did indeed. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was a piece authored by an uh, Afro-Caribbean author, and he was exploring actually Asian black racism. And, and so it was effectively, I mean, I'm a Jew, so and, man, yeah. and we go to Tottenham and we all chant years. And, I'm, <laughs> and I'm, I'm fine with that because it's us reappropriating a racist word. Yeah, but do you like the word queer? Um, well, I don't feel I'm... Well, it's not my choice. Do you know what I mean? Um, well, it's, yeah, it's, I don't feel it's... I mean, I wouldn't call somebody queer. Um, if... Um, I wouldn't call... I wouldn't want someone to call me a yid. Mm. But when we chant yids, and I don't mind if there are non-Jews in the crowd, we all chant yids, and it's, I think it's sort of embracing it. This programme, you want to be... Uh, who you're calling nigger, is basically getting people to look at racism. And because he's an Afro-Caribbean guy, I thought he had the right to author that show. But So you know the context if you watch the programme or if you read the blurb and the TV guide, but perhaps you're just seeing it subliminally or as part of you know, some material you're looking at. Isn't, isn't it just kind of um, you know, precipitating I also think there's a generation. No, no, I, I, think I think there's a generation of black people who would find that... I mean, maybe the people who are already here, but I think there's a generation of black people parents and grandparents would hurt them. It yeah, would it, physically hurt actually, them. Actually, let, let me just cut in there, because we are going to come back a bit yeah. more to the subject. <laughs> but actually, you raise a good point. Uh, <coughs> Channel 4 recently broadcast a program with one of the, um, I think it was one of the guys from NDubs, talking about the reclaiming of the word nigger by a black community and talking to members of the black community, some of whom accepted it, who tended to be slightly younger, and those who are much older found it much more offensive and actually creating the image that those words were acceptable. Um, and I think the point you're raising is the frequency with which you use this makes it more acceptable in society. But Roy's point, to slightly summarise you, is it's about context ultimately. And I think if you saw it the sounds program, like a bad context, swear word to me. Yeah, and I can understand the context. Well, let me let me move along because I want to get on to sort of wider issues that this type of examples give rise to. Um, this is to the producers and the commissioners here. Do you think, as program makers and commissioners, that sometimes because of the plethora of channels and shows that you have to go for the headline grabbing shock tactic to get bums on seats. Mm. Is that a fair criticism mm. or an observation? I think yes, definitely. I mean, Beauty and the Beast was a good example of in disability recently. It's very hard to get audience to um, disability programs and you take a kind of, uh, you have to take a balance view on whether you're going to get more people of the sort of people who wouldn't have normally come to the show and then they might come slightly for the wrong reason but they'll stay for the right reason if it's a good show okay emma um i mean i guess i am slightly i i, I mean of course we all want bums on seats but also i want to make stuff that makes me very interested and excited and i kind of think that's why we're here so I, 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 it is a bit of a, a cop-out to say context and the way that we, that we make these programmes. But I do, I, I, yeah, I'm a big believer in, 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 in pushing it and showing stuff that, that is going to be quite shocking, but not for the sake of shocking, no. Roy? Well, 
I mean, I don't want to re repeat things that are obviously true, and I think both things you said are obviously true. I think titles are only a problem when they deeply, deeply offend the people who've been in the programme and given up their time. So, for example, mm. we did a programme years ago about the phenomenon of what was called wiggers, which, you know, white guys who talk, you know, sort of... Uh, you know, want to sound black. And we talked to lots of people. It's quite an interesting program, quite an interesting phenomenon. And then um, the title of the program eventually, at very late date, was called I Want to Be Black. And some of the people in it had not been told that and got very upset about it. So there's an interesting case. Obviously, we all want to get people to a show. Mm. Um, the offence in that case wasn't necessarily to the audience, but it was to the participants. And uh, that was a problem. Can I ask sort of, Julian, Dave, and uh, Lucille, do you think, from your sort of mixed perspectives, that audiences are becoming desensitized? Given that with the explosion of the internet, two clicks on the mouse and you can see stuff far worse than this any time uh, without any boundaries whatsoever. Do you think, in a sense, audiences are more cynical about these attempts to kind of get them on, get their attention? I, I, I think, uh, for me personally, I think a title of a show, <coughs> excuse me, a title of a show really does capture um, somebody's sort of thoughts, or am I going to sit and watch this? If, it, if the title was boring, you'd, you'd sort of flick through, you wouldn't really be interested in watching it, because you want to find out more with a shocking title. You're going to think, oh, is this going to be as juicy as I expect it to be? Because I think nowadays, children, as you're saying, can go on the internet and watch somebody blow their head off or, or whatever. So, you know, at that point, for them to tune in at seven o'clock to watch something along those lines it is okay, because at the end of the day, shock TV still sells, and people like to see other people suffering to make themselves feel better about themselves, I think. I, I think it's obvious that people will be desensitized if they're exposed constantly to this stuff. I'm often surprised, though, how, despite having all this material, people are still very, relatively uncritical about it and passive viewers. And, you know, example, which being the only way is Essex and, and Made in Chelsea, that this ridiculous new scripted reality TV, I'd have thought people are so exposed to this stuff that they would be more... Uh, cynical and critical. But the scary stupid. thing is, though, they believe it's true. Mm. <laughs> I, know they, you know, I get it. I think, yeah. it, makes, I think it makes the youth today I think, uh, not so uh, nice. I think even if they don't believe it's true, they, they buy into it. I think, I think they might accept that it's Absolutely. terribly contrived, but they still watch it and, and still you know, follow the narrative and, and, and become emotionally attached to the characters. And when you see it being done so well yeah. on American television in the hills and the city with these you know, perfectly groomed uh, American kids who are just ready for fame as fetuses, that um, you know, we'd be slightly better at that stuff. But, but the, the okay, let, let me, we're going to come back to those kind of scripted realities. Can I just do a show of hands to the audience? Who thinks audiences today are more desensitized and more cynical about these kind of shock tactics that we've used in the old days? If you think they are more desensitized, just put your hands up. So that's probably the majority in the room. Okay. Um, that's, we've now looked at the past. We're now going to look forward to more current examples. And I think um, one of the criticisms that's been made of the kind of shock elements to kind of get bums on seats is that some of the more classic social taboos have been overlooked. And these are social taboos which are very common. They're not that shocking in, in many respects. But actually, factual programming has sometimes failed to tackle them adequately, either not taking them seriously or tiptoeing around the edges. Now, we're going to begin this section with looking at the issue of the community and class. Now, um, there's no doubt that this has often been labeled by the tabloids as modern-day class warfare, and by others as an insightful look into communities that a few really understand. So let's look at two contrasting clips of modern programs, and then we're going to debate the issue of class and community. For hundreds of years, the traveler way of life was one of ancient traditions and simple tastes. Then, their world collided with the 21st century. With unprecedented access to the UK's most secretive communities. They don't like anybody knowing anything about them at all. They even have their own language. This series will take you to the very heart of gypsy life. Yay! Through the biggest celebrations in the traveller calendar. From the most extravagant children's parties. Look at this. Would you ever get the toenails painted on that? To the biggest weddings on earth. It's the biggest day of 
a travelling guy's life. <laughs> Very stressed. People are turning up on time, but that's Gypsy's ways. Nothing never gets done properly. <laughs> and from birth all the way to the grave. Cheers, my Patrick. Cheers, my son. Over five episodes, this series will explore unique aspects of gypsy and traveller life. In a world where a man is a man. A woman knows her place. And courtship blossoms in an unusual way. Go and try and give you a kiss straight away, so you got to kind of beat them for the kiss. But this is a community under threat. The Tinkers arrived, I don't really know what to call them, one evening, all very unexpected. Fighting for its very survival. She's not a dog! She's a human being! How long can the party last? <laughs> Tucked away in the picturesque setting of the Lake District is the Damson Dean. Hello. A typical three-star holiday hotel. What name is it, please? Uh, Mr. Farmworth, Mr. and Mrs. Farmworth. It has a suave owner. I would say that we cater for Mondeo Man. We cater for the ordinary visitor. A creative chef. Hot it off. Would you want to dip your cock in it? <sighs> Me neither. That means it's hot enough. An ambitious manager. I've got somebody waiting. I have given you the list. Yeah, but Check the those rooms. And like any quintessentially English hotel, the staff are mainly from Eastern Europe. So, każde jebane wesele jest tak samo. They ordered some special bread for me. Rye bread. Rye. 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 No tea. Rye. rye. What is this rye bread? I don't know. Rye bread. Together. They cater for the great British public. This is nowhere near the light the room there now. Yeah. Who come here for a break, bringing all their baggage with them. If you say that once more, Love right, you. it's over. That's it. <laughs> Every day, these two worlds collide, staff and guests. Room six are complaining about that this morning. With manager Wayne caught in the middle. Are you smoking outside? Oh, some of you. Right, come with me. <coughs> Trent. Upstairs. Excuse me, there's somebody in our room using our shower. And downstairs. Either she has to go or I have to go. Hey, Moss. This is life in a British hotel as it's never been seen before. Okay, um, those clips were picked specifically because they're contrasting uh, <laughs> programs in how they tackle the issue of class and community. Um, the hotel is, is a sort of modern day interpretation of faulty towns, effectively, and in many ways is quite revisionist of many similar types of programs, but it's bringing in quite large audiences. Gypsy Weddings brought in at one point an, an audience of about 8.5 million and wow. has clearly grabbed the audience's attention. Um, in addition, you've got things like the scripted reality shows, which we're going to come on to in a minute, like The Only Way is Essex, which are bringing in huge numbers on the digital channels. And you've got a recent announcement by BBC Three that they're going to be doing Strictly Kosher, which is looking at the Jewish community in Manchester. So Hello. class and community are very, very big. But let me just start with the panel here, and then I'll come to the audience. Um, British society has always been obsessed by class, and no more so than in factual programming. It brings in big, old, big audiences, and we're actually quite curious to know about communities we've not seen or heard of before. And we also have an obsession in this country about class. But do you think these programs are genuinely insightful and educating, educative? Or is this an opportunity to sort of sneer mm. and laugh and be sort of exercise some snobbery at those less fortunate? Can I start <laughs> with the producers and then pass over? Um, well... I mean, I'll just talk about gypsies. I'm a big fan of gypsies. I mean, I do think I probably would have made it slightly different. Um, but I, it, I, I'm not um, upset about it in any way. Um, and I think that actually they made the show the way they did for the slot that they did. And actually... Um, they did show many, many things. They showed quite a lot of the Romany, the, the Appleby, um, the communions, the confirmations. They didn't just show the weddings, and I think it, it, there's a temptation with the audience to only remember the weddings. 
Um, and, and, and actually, I think that they did give a very good snapshot of that community. And that's a community that I was spending time with at the same time <laughs> um, and chasing at the same time. So I do feel that I kind of got to know them a bit too. And, 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 I, and, I, and I think it was a really successful programme. And, and I don't, you know, I think maybe there's a bit of a snobbery in itself by being snobby about that programme, if you know what I mean. Can I, can I just ask the audience, show of hands, how many people have watched Gypsy Weddings? How many like it or enjoy it? How many don't like it or think it's exploitation? So it's quite interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we got some feedback from viewers, and actually the overwhelming majority do find it genuinely insightful. Um, mm. Although, interestingly, most things they remember are the weddings and nothing else. And um, it's interesting that the, the, what was originally a one-hour program in a cutting-edge strand is now in a series. Um, shows that there is a real appetite to know about these hidden communities who for many years did not want to engage with the media. Um, and in fact, Emma, I think you were saying to me they're still very reluctant notwithstanding the Yeah, I mean, trend. B B Paddy, who, who I know was the guy with the baby and at his son's uh, graveside, like, got hospitalised. I think not directly to, God please, not directly to do with the programme, but, but, but he was introducing quite a few of us to various people, and, uh, you know, some of the community didn't like it, because they're a very close community, and they deal with, like, we were chasing them to uh, see how they, would, how they dealt with disputes through bare-knuckle fighting, um, and, and actually they deal with many of their um, kind of uh, issues with one another in that way, it, it would seem. So, so, yeah, not everybody was pleased. Lucille, could I ask you, do you think there are members of the audience, and possibly a significant number, who are probably less than honest to say, actually, it, it is about sneering and it is about having a laugh at the expense of others? Yeah, yes, and the, the first time that I noticed that was actually, and I've said this before, that when they were taken out of context and when they appeared on the correct, because I always say Graham Norton, it's the, it's the other Carr, guy, Alan yeah. Carr. I don't know if anyone saw a couple of the, um, the people from the show on there, and it was interesting to see them, their first experience out of the show, and see how the attitude had sort of turned a bit. They were definitely up for, uh, for sneering in that occasion. Like, it, it became was, a Jeremy was, Kyle it, show. Yeah, yeah it was, it, they, they were turned into a bit of a joke mm. on there, and I thought, all oh, that you have to... Yeah, he's debatable. You, you know, there's no sort of the line. protection could, there. Can I come to you, Roy? Does this raise an interesting issue? Are mm. these individuals who clearly have, in, through informed consent, have decided to represent part of their community, can they give consent on behalf of the community at large? Because many would say this is, and many have amongst the traveller and gypsy community, saying this is not representative of their community. I think, I think it's very complex. I think that part of this is about the programmes and how they're viewed, but it's also a question about what is prejudice? Prejudice is generally believed to flow from lack of knowledge. So if you increase the amount of knowledge about something, then you're likely to, to lessen prejudice. And so the question you could ask yourselves is, are documentaries, factual programming, um, helping inform us about the community, which as you said, they did. About 20, God, 24 years ago, I made a film called Volvo City, and that was about the Orthodox Jews of Stamford Hill, which they're about to go into again. And that was a community that, by and large, rejected television. Uh, the rabbi in the first few minutes of the program described um, Television is a sewer through the living room, was his quote. And I got into the community after about a year of hard work uh, through this guy, and he was a rabbi, orthodox rabbi, you know, the black hats, the, the full Polish garb. Cowboy. And, uh, you know, Hasidic Jews, as they're known. It took a lot of work. He let us in. And the film, made a long time ago, it was shown again at a festival recently, might stand up to scrutiny slightly. Styles have changed quite a lot. There was no commentary. Um, lots, lots of things about it were different. But afterwards, um, we invited that rabbi to a group of filmmakers to chat to us. And he, he came along. He's a very humorous bloke. He said, look, uh, I let you guys in. Now my wife doesn't talk to me. People shun me in the street. And he was partly playing up. He was quite a sort of joker. But I think he certainly had suffered from letting us in. He, they felt he'd sort of sold them down the river. Um, the program was, I think, gentler in some ways, partly because it was made 24 years ago. Than, and it, wasn't, it would be now called, you know, my big fat something or other, um, Volvo City, which I still loved as a title because they all drove Volvo. <laughs> um, you wouldn't get away with it now, it'd be Jews in black hats or something. Um, so I, I, I don't know if I'm really making much of a point here. I think that it is controversial if you're in, within that community about whether the small number of them have a right 
to put you on the big stage. And with something as incredibly popular as this, yeah, they're going to be unpopular. I don't think getting them beaten up is justifiable in any way whatsoever. But you're going to you're going to split people. But but it is their personal choice. I mean, you know. Uh, no, but it isn't the choice of the people who aren't on screen. It no. might be the choice of the people who are on screen. Yeah. Now, you might argue that it can't be a fascistic society. That, I mean, the, the Does, doesn't that raise, is quite fascistic. Yeah. Doesn't is. that raise a, a rather broader point, Julian, which is um, these people no longer contribute to documentary. They are now celebrities. Yeah. That's what I was, I was just going to say. You know, they are, they are therefore playing up to an image mm. or an it's exaggerated form like of their image. Brother, because the first series of Big Brother, people didn't know they were going to be famous afterwards. So it was brilliant. When they thought they were going to be famous afterwards, we lost that. Mm. And I think that's what happens with these programs. The first Gypsy is brilliant. Now I understand that every Gypsy in the world wants to be on television. Mm -hmm. So they're going to be prepared for the fame afterwards. I think that's where it, that's where it loses its magic for me. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can I just ask the audience, does, does anyone feel that the brand, to a certain extent, we've now had one program, I think a five-part series, I think there's now going to be a return series. Do you think, in a sense, they're slightly flogging a dead horse here? Um, one person at the back. Anyone else? Or would actually, you'd love to see more of this. You're bored of it? Have we got a mic, friends? No, I'm not bored of it, but I think, you know, the first one hour was brilliant. And it did, it exposed a lot of things that we didn't know anything about. But, you know, to have a repeat series, and yes, people remember the weddings, and there's the fighting and everything else, but I think it's like, okay, that's enough. Let them go back to their lives and, you know, they don't have to constantly be the only source of entertainment on TV. Let's pick on someone else. <laughs> the problem I find is how do they go back to their lives after being on a show like that? I mean, <clears throat> coming from several reality shows, watching, especially the crew from the Anyways Essex, watching them now, <clears throat> excuse me, back in their lives, which was basically what the show was about, which wasn't really their lives, um, to, to, you know, refusing to appear at a charity event unless they paid £5,000. And it's that whole, like, get over yourself, you were nothing before, you still are, it just happens to be on a TV show. And I think it's very difficult for people to get yeah. back into reality because their reality was scripted for so long. Yeah, I think that the difficulty here with sort of documentaries is that when the programme first came to air, it was genuinely insightful, as Emma said, about parts mm. of the community. As the series progresses, are you learning anything new, Alison? Well, or actually, have you learned I, it all before? I think you get, you, prob <laughs> you, you may learn little bits here and there, but I think you get into very dangerous territory when you keep referring to sort of, when you keep expecting films about individuals from specific communities to teach you about the whole, every single gypsy, every single Jew, every mm -hmm. single disabled yeah. person. And I think, um, you know, you have to, be a bit more relaxed about it and um, treat each individual program on its own merits and not expect telly to be a kind of social engineering tool. Um, it is primarily for entertainment, in my view, and I mean, you can't argue with the fact that Gypsies was absolutely very entertaining, but I'm, I mean, I agree with you, I was, I was flagging a bit by the end of the series, whereas when I f saw, f saw the first cut of the first film, I was absolutely, I thought this was eye-popping and fascinating and I remember a lot more than just the wedding I remember the you know the the way the women kind of saw their lives and the girls were brought up and you know I think it, it taught me a whole lot but I didn't therefore think I know all about travelers now I mean I know about those particular people in those in the, in the way that they wanted to be filmed in a way you know it's a contract isn't it all the time I think that's a fair point, because I think there's a perception uh, that actually you create a cultural stereotype, and therefore the Big Fat Gypsy Wedding represents all gypsies and all communities all around the world. Um, I also want to raise the second point, which is that a lot of people have criticised these programmes for being entertainment, or factual entertainment, as they're <laughs> commonly referred. Um, now, Big Fat Gypsy Wedding was an observational documentary to start with. It has slightly changed in its format as it's progressed, but do the audience feel that the element of entertainment in documentaries is a bad thing? Show of hands, anyone thinks it is? Do you think it's worrying when we look at gypsies that um, it is deemed as entertainment, but yet some mm. of the, like the footage we saw of the girls being pushed around as part of the courting process and the sexualization of children so young. It's shocking. That there's, you know, a large amount of that content is quite controversial and disturbing. But at least they do have a community and they stick with each other. 
They're loyal that's to each a, that's other. That's the it scary really thing. We think we, I mean, people watch that thinking, oh, I have such a fabulous life. I go to here and I drive this car. But realistically, you don't have a family no. uh, a, a network behind you a lot of the time because you're left to defend for yourself. And then you watch Big Fat Gypsy when you realize that these guys stick together. Yeah, and that is ultimately yeah. more important than anything let else. Me, let me just move you on from that. Sorry. Uh, Leave at the back, raise the issue about where the documentary should be. Done. Can I get a microphone? Would you? Can I just ask you? Um, do you think it's the purpose of documentary? Are you opposed to documentaries being entertaining? No, no, no. I think documentaries should be entertaining. <laughs> I think there's a danger that if there is a deliberate entertainment part to making the program, that you end up trying to look for the big character. You end up trying. I mean, the second series of Big Fat is going to have to do something different from the first which means it has to almost become a caricature hmm. or, uh, over time, uh, of, of episode by episode, as Big Brother did, really. They, they began recruiting people who were different crazy. and alternative <laughs> and cra crazy. Yeah. Well, that, that conveniently can I, um, bring, that can, oh, sorry. So that, well, I think, um, Ryan, who I know at the back, used the word entertaining, I think I heard you correctly, hmm. rather than entertainment. And entertainment and entertaining are not the same thing. I think if you don't want to reach a large audience, you shouldn't, really be doing television or as large an audience for your work as can be cleaned and i think you know we all do different work i do stuff for bbc4 for channel 4 occasionally bbc1 and you're trying to reach you don't want ever on purpose to reach a smaller audience than you can but it's a question of whether you're trying too hard and i think that you know it's the integrity is the thing i think most people in here can spot integrity and so you can have integrity with something that's very manufactured. I mean, the only way is Essex has an integrity. It may not be its integrity of its own. It knows what it's doing. I think quite a lot of the audience know what it's doing. And I, I heard what you said. You think everyone believes in it. He's not everybody. Not, I'm not saying everybody, but there's a massive, well, there's a huge majority of people that really do think it's true. The first series was factually, sort of, it was factual, basically, and it really was for a night. It's come the second series, you know, they're saying, Lauren, you need to propose, and this is what's going to happen. And by the end of the second series, you will be walking out on him because he will have cheated on somebody. And they do it because they're not, they're getting 50 quid an episode, but they're making five grand a pop for the story. You know, so it automatically takes it away from being factual. As you're saying j just now, you know, when you come to the second series of Big Fat Gypsy Winning, you hope it's going to get even better than the first one because suddenly you're taking away from, uh, you know, what we've already seen is what we've seen. There needs to be more than what they already showed in the first series. Well, can I, can I just move on? That's a convenient link into what's referred to as scripted reality shows. So we have The Only Way is Essex, which is hugely popular on ITV2. <coughs> we have Made in Chelsea on E4. We have Geordie Shaw, which I think is on MTV. MTV. Now, um, these are all referred to as soap meets documentary, although most documentary makers I know would have nothing to do with these programs. However, they are hugely, hugely popular within a certain age range of about 16 to 24. Um, just in a show of hands, how many people think that they are a genuine development of documentaries, or how many people alternatively think they're actually, it's more contrived. So if you think it's contrived, put your hands up. And if you think it's a genuine development from documentaries, put your hand up. I kind of guess that answer, really. Um, so do we think that ultimately these programs play on cultural stereotypes? The classic Essex man, Essex woman, the kind of posh Chelsea couple. I mean, they're sort of an exaggeration of class warfare, aren't they, effectively? Oh, dressed up as entertainment. Yes, the trouble is, with The Only Way is Essex, is the girls are over made up, over plumped. But that's what not, they look like when you meet not, them. But you shouldn't, people should be watching that. That's not how you should look. And the girls are like thick in the only way is Essex. And you get made in Chelsea and the boys are thick. Yeah, you but see. they're pretty. <laughs> yeah, we want to see pretty. It's not interesting. <laughs> let, let, I don't want to see them with loads yeah. of money. Ask, well, going, uh, is my hair too shiny? Yeah. Have I got enough hair extensions? Do you I, think, think, I think it's too much. Yeah, Emma, do you think they're just harmless or harmless entertainment? We shouldn't yeah, take them I seriously. Them. Completely. I mean, you know, you can't say fair in that. Everybody is going into this with their eyes open. The people know that they're caricature, they are caricatures. They're kind of happy with that. I really enjoy watching it. I know I'm not watching a documentary. I, 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 you know, I get astounded by it, um, and and I, you know, it's like a soap opera to me. I, I, don't, I really don't have a problem with it. Interestingly, I, I, I think kids. I think, I don't know. I'm really interested in what you say, and I, you, you, I believe what you're saying. You may know more about it than me. My kids watch different things in different ways. Yeah. Um, come dine with me. They watch as enjoyable shit and they really do they think well, it's because what's yeah, his name yeah. Mr. Lamb does a voice over you watch that it's on 24 comedy. hours a day <laughs> but that's true but everybody's <laughs> cooked for but, channel but 4 but I think they know what it is I think mm. people um, 
you know, I, I it's education. With Alison. I think when you're saying, of course, one film about a group of gypsies isn't saying these are all, all, all gypsies, but it is probably the first time a big primetime documentary has been made about that group. It's obviously going to inform what people think. And I think Channel 4 has got to acknowledge that if you put a series out about gypsies, it's going to inform what people think about them. I think it's slightly yeah, but disingenuous. Well, that's what TV is right. generally. They, they're, they're one would hope aren't. that they don't put out one film about gypsies and that's it forever. I mean, I, I've had this problem with disability all the time, is that, you know, you see a film made about blind people and it might show them in a bad light, and suddenly we're hit with complaints because they're saying that all blind parents are bad. You know, right. you can't. It's you. You have to get a mix of um, portrayals. You know, and then, and I, I don't think. You know, I hope. You know, the audience doesn't take their entire um, view on a particular community well, well, or. Let me just give you an illustration of the point you're raising, actually, because. Earlier this week, some of you may have seen this, there's a, a new book being published called Chavs, The Demonization of the Working Class. Um, it's been written by a former trade unionist who claims <laughs> that television and government, I should stress, has um, basically turned its back on the working class and actually class snobbery, mm. persecution and exploitation is now mm. currently in vogue, no more so than on television. And illustrations that have been given include wife swap and the only way is Essex. Now, Many people who live in the area in Brentwood, because I think, Julian, you were in the first series? Yeah, I did the first series. I actually am obviously clearly not from Essex, but uh, I was roped in halfway through to stir Which it up a little bit, and I was fabulous. I was fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, it's you, all around but, Brentwood and Loughton. But would you say, if you lived in Brentwood, and many people have commented in the paper, this programme is not representative of their community. Absolutely. And they say it's, it's quite a slur on them. And it's, it's back to Alison's point. Yeah. You know, um, wrongly, people have assumed that this is stereotypical Essex. But how can well, they... Sorry. sorry, it is stereotypically Essex for that, peop, that group of people. Remember, you know, Mark was the main character and these were his network of friends around them. Sarah Dilliston, the executive producer, spent a year trying to find the right lead character um, in order to make it entertaining on television. Because a lot of the other people they met were just normal people that happened to live in Essex that didn't really want their lives on TV because it really wasn't that fascinating. But then you found one chap called Mark Wright who talked about himself in the third person. Well, you know, as Mark Wright, I do this. You know, I'm going to open a club and all the rest of it. She went, this guy is pure comedy. This is TV. But is this any but different if it was an observational documentary about Essex people? Oh, God, well, yeah, yeah, it's And in a way, that's why I'm glad it is so clunky and so obvious and so amateur and so stilted and that you, you can only assume that these are ridiculous panto stereotypes. I'd feel more worried about the people and the content of that show if it was more naturalistic and more professional. It's not amateur. It's, it's really about as professional a job. I mean, oh, it's well, well, twice the price of... It costs about 250 yeah, grand the, a pop. The people are amateur. <laughs> the people in it... Like, I tell you, well, I mean, like, I know what you know, you're saying, but they're, but they're pros. They're doing it for money, actually. Oh, yes, well, this was it. The first... Let me reiterate. Sorry, I just want to, just I'm, want I'm, to I'm, say that they're pros, as in, like, like I said about the American series, they're so slick at delivering their lines and making it look real mm. and putting some emotion into it. Uh, what I just mean is that if, you know, that... Yes, you're, they're professional public being doing what they're being told to do, but not as selling it as any kind of reality. Yeah, they're not okay. naturalistic. Let's, 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 yeah. let's move away from that okay. to scripture reality. Let's yes. go back okay. to factual <laughs> problems. But, 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 but can I, can, can I just say, though, Sorry, I mean, just on the point of stereotype, I mean, of course, stereotypes exist everywhere, and I think we might as well all go home now. If you, if you look at a stereotype, <laughs> recognise it, and then think, oh, that's like everybody from that place. No. No. I mean, you know, it is TV. Yeah. Alison's right, you know, and, and stereotypes show but look they're not you know it's stereotypes it's soaps are full TV. of stereotypes yeah. I mean, at the end of the day it's very entertaining yeah. but I'd rather see a really good drama spend some money on that Okay. Um, let, me, let me turn to one last area in this section before we move on to another one which is the proliferation of what the tabloids refer to as poverty porn uh, these are programs like Fairy Godmother, Secret Millionaire, How the Other Half Live, which seem to, if you would accept the tabloid criticism, exploit and patronise the poor for entertainment. Now, does anyone in this room who's only seen those programmes agree yeah. with that? You think they're absolutely fine, those programmes? What do our panel think? Well, I... Mm. I can't really talk about this. They're a bit I'm too angry con about this. Th they're a bit too contrived for me. Yeah. Uh, you know, and the casting, I don't always think is that brilliant. Um, you know. 
I, always I find they go I, I into find, their lives, I give find, them something, and then walk away, and then they're just left on their own again. It's like taking them from here, putting them up here, and then they're just left back down there again. I mean, we were talking the other day about, is there a network to support these people once you've left their lives? You know, they're left stranded, they're thinking, oh my God, I've just had this amazing experience, and suddenly I'm back down to being like, in the pits again. Uh, on that point, I mean, we just did Dream School, and we put in a year's support network for the kids afterwards for that very reason. I think you're absolutely right. I think that sort of a month of television love and then fuck off is yeah. really dangerous. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, to be honest, those formats which... I mean, the downside of, of those formats is it, it's obviously very good PR. I mean, you know, Secret Millionaire is very good PR for, for somebody, but at least they, they're showing uh, in some semi-documentary style real issues being faced in, in, in hardship and to some extent some real money's been given. I don't think it's that bad. I slightly prefer them contrived and formatted there they are than stereotype telly. I think stereotype telly we've just been talking about is fun and entertaining, but you know, are stereotypes that interesting? So uh, after a while, after a while they get really dark. Let, let me, sorry, I'm gonna cut you off there. So we're gonna move on to the next section. Um, we're gonna move away from class community and we're gonna look at the body beautiful. Now, there's no doubt that the representation of disability in factual programming has greatly increased in recent, in recent years, but there are still many in the disabled community who would argue that that representation is fairly low compared to the successes of other communities, particularly the gay community. So I'm gonna show you here a couple of examples, contrasting examples of the current trend to tackle prejudice head, head on, and then we have a quick debate about this. Nine out of ten women in Britain are unhappy with their appearance. I have an obsession with the way I look. Over half would resort to surgery to change it. Anything that says it's going to make you younger and beautiful, I will try. And nearly three quarters of Brits believe that being better looking would make them more successful. You get ahead in life, you're beautiful, and you don't get forward being ugly. The message is, if you're not beautiful, you're worthless. And this is breeding a generation of beauty addicts. My Christmas list for cosmetic surgery is liposuction on my legs and my arms and my tummy. Lip fillers, face fillers. Chin implants. Botox. I want to change everything. <sighs> but this emerging beauty fascism is not only breeding a generation of women dissatisfied with their looks. It's feeding the prejudice faced by anyone who doesn't fit the conventional idea of beauty. People would stop and stare. Stop, literally stop and stare. He obviously thought I was wearing a mask. I'm just going to start like tugging up my face. If he wants to put barriers in my way, then I'll count these barriers. It's the estimated half a million people in the UK who have a significant facial disfigurement. In this series, six visually different people will live with six beauty obsessives, immersing themselves in each other's worlds. There is a beast out there that needs to be fed. There's a whole industry out there that needs to make women in particular feel insecure about their body image and then feed off it. If you see comes in many forms, as do this. Do I think it's important that you live the life you have, as opposed to mourning the one you don't? Can their experience help both those dissatisfied with their looks and those that face discrimination every day? If I can make a difference to stop one kid going through what I went through, then I'll talk about this all day, every day, for the rest of my life, happily. I've decided to find out whether you can really have an active and fulfilling sex life when you're confined to a wheelchair. Ben Pickard was a happy-go-lucky 20-year-old. Like most single blokes his age, he had a big interest in women. But then Ben was involved in a car accident. He's now 34 and is one of the 40,000 people living with spinal cord injury in the UK. He's tetraplegic paralysed from the chest down. Hi, Ben. Anna, good Hello. morning. Hello. How did Devil like you? Give a kiss. Mm, oh, aye, aye. Nice Here to see you. Here we go. Good to see you. <laughs> there are around 1,200 new cases of spinal cord injury every year in Britain. I can feel most of my arms and my shoulders. So you can feel uh, all of this? Yeah, yeah. Go on, keep going. Give a little massage along here. It's a long, it's a long so journey it, down. Obviously, yeah, because you're moving. You can feel all of this. Yeah, that's good. Uh, I, can, I can sort of feel the shoulders, but my, my sensory feeling just stops, stops and starts above my nipples. Ooh. So, I, I mean, pr in, in, roughly speaking, percentage-wise, I would say I can't feel maybe 85% of my body. With my injury, you know, it's not just what you see 
pushing a wheelchair. It's, um, I'm doubly incontinent. Oh, really? Impudent. A soft willy. Right, so soft cock with. all the time. All the time. <laughs> really? To say it as it is. If you're doubly incontinent, oh, that must be a nightmare when you're sleeping with somebody, isn't it? My first sexual experience, um, literally, I think the first time I'd had sex since I broke my neck, I pissed on her and then fell out of bed. No. I mean, I'm not familiar with the Karma Sutra, but I don't think that one's in there, <laughs> is it? <laughs> Okay, can I start with Alison? Alison, mm. these are a new breed of programming which are very much in your face in tackling issue of disability. Do you think it's just a different way of tackling disability? Uh, yeah, and I think it's much to be welcomed, really, because I think embedding that sort of um, frank discussion in programmes that are big mainstream shows, uh, not all about disability, um, is a really good way to deal with prejudice. Um, I mean, you know, one of the, the great things about the audience feedback for um, Born to, um, sorry, Beauty and the Beast was uh, how people, f by the end of each program, were not noticing the disfigurement in the contributors with disfigurement. And I think that kind of where disabled people um, hit non-disabled people is a really interesting area and that's always, you know, the more we can get that into our programmes and into programmes that lots of people watch without thinking it's going to be ooh, a dreary doc about disability, you know, the better as far as I'm concerned. Does, um, Emma, do, do you agree with that? Is there, does any, are those two programmes, do you feel slightly uncomfortable? You didn't like <laughs> Beauty and the Beast, I know. Oh, I feel... No, I didn't. I'm really... Um, I'm, I, I, I watched it completely as a viewer, um, and I found the beautiful people, just the, the casting of it, I knew where I was being led, um, and, and, and I, I just disliked them so much. It was quite difficult for me to kind of accept it as a format. And also, I kind of did feel that, again, it was asking me for sympathy... Um, when actually I would much prefer to have somebody with a disability assimilated just into kind of like a cast. But, but I mm. appreciate the fact from talking to you that that is an ideal world and that's not happening. Therefore, these, these programmes kind of exist. So I kind of really admire... And, and obviously, you know, I'm clearly wrong because it did like three and a half million, didn't it? And it was doing incredibly well. I just kind of felt that I was being... It was just really obvious the way I was being led and I, I wasn't that certain that I, li that I liked that. Roy, do you think they're a sort of an, an indication nowadays that we want to tackle disability more head-on? We're less sort of tinkering around the edges or looking for the plucky hero or the victim. But actually I thought the second programme was very different from the first one. Mm. I thought Anna Richardson talking about that guy was wonderful. Yeah. I thought he was... You know, he had his dignity. And also, I like to be surprised. I really do. And I think that Beauty and the Beast, although... Uh, I mean, I don't know. I didn't feel that strongly. But you, it's those Hollywood... You know those Hollywood movies where you absolutely know, particularly the, the liberal porn Hollywood movies, where you know what they want you to think? And slightly with that one, I got the point in the title. I got the point in the pre-title. Mm. And they didn't find it surprised me enough. Whereas... And I know, I mean, it, it was, it yeah. was well-intentioned, perfectly. But what I liked about the Anna one is she's asking him straight questions. He's answering straight. I mean, they're both good, but I preferred the second one because it was, it was straighter, actually. Lucille, can I ask you, what, what did you think? Well, I, I feel really bad commenting this because I've literally just seen the clips. I didn't watch either of the programmes. I agree that I felt a little bit led with the first one, and Beauty and the Geek as well. As you say, if the title says it all, then you don't have much, that far to go. And I thought that the presenter, is it Katie? the beautiful one who was beautiful before and then beautiful after her reconstruction. And I, I don't know, maybe I was a bit cynical about that, even though she's obviously amazing. Um, that, uh, I, I, I did like the second one. She makes me laugh as a presenter. I think sometimes she's a little bit too uh, uh, yeah, convivial about. Is, is there anything wrong? I mean, it's interesting, two panel have already mentioned feeling slightly embarrassed about being critical of these type of programmes, but oh, no. are we overly sensitive to the issue of disability? Um, do in many ways, shouldn't we treat programmes which feature disabled contributors in exactly the same way? If they're good, they're good. If they're shit, they're shit. And not yeah. feel so het up about the fact that, oh, it's a disabled... I should really like it, but I don't. And therefore, I feel a bit embarrassed. I, I, it's... See, it's a tough one for me, this. I mean, the, the first Beauty and the Beast, for me, you know, I actually know a couple of the girls in that who I can't stand personally because 
I don't know, uh, that show made me walk away realizing that, you know, the ones that think they're pretty are actually the most insecure out of everybody. Um, and insecurity is a massive thing and a massive issue. And I've been through that insecurity being off, before getting into TV, I was chief stylist at Marie Claire magazine. It was all about beauty, it was about looking beautiful. First show cry <coughs> for a straight guy, you know, taking these chaps that, you know, were slobs, yobs, couldn't cook, wouldn't dress, blah, 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 and turning them into what the p world or the public saw as beautiful. Um, uh, and, and giving them that little bit of confidence and such. And then I see this first program, and you know, these, the, the, these chaps and the ladies with the disabilities are more confident than any person I know within the TV world. I mean, I, mean, I went and had my Botox done yesterday because I need to, because I start filming again, because there's the pressures that I'm under to do that. And it's the most non-important thing when you look at other people's lives like that. And I walk away thinking, I'm actually lucky to be alive and have my health, and ultimately that's far more important than worrying whether my lips are plump enough to give the best blowjob ever tomorrow night when I go out clubbing in Essex. Do you know what I mean? And this is the, this is the world that these girls live in, you know, because they all want to be the wag. They want to, uh, you know, and working within the fashion industry, putting on the front cover of every magazine, this is what beauty is. It's been touched up a hundred times, and this is actually not what Kate Moss looks like when she gets out of bed. No one ever does. Um, so I always feel exceptionally guilty about the fact that I am sucked into that industry because unfortunately that's what I'm good at doing is making people look pretty. Um, but programs like this, you know, I, I, don't, I walk away feeling sorry for the ones that think they're pretty. Dave, can I ask you, uh, as a drag queen who dresses up and therefore is under a sort of a disguise... This is his normal look. <laughs> It, are I? These, I mean, it's interesting. We, the, the, that program, we, everyone talks about the disability element, but few people talk about the body dysmorphia issues, mm. which are all equally raised in the program. And got and a massive response online. Indeed. Big, yeah. Bigger than anything we've ever seen. On the, the little test I, online. Yeah, I have been sucked into because of the drag. I never came out when I did the act. I mean, my drag name is Dave Lynn. So it wasn't meant to be a woman, it was meant to be a man dressed up. The fact that it looked good was something the audience and other people told me. And I did get sucked into it a bit, you know, go to the gym, keep slim, make sure you look like that, because uh, I felt I had to please what the audience want. I mean, I remember, I, thinking about what you said, the first pantomime I did was Snow White, and I remember being terrified of the dwarves. I don't know why, um, and they were terrified of me. As soon as I walked down in the drag, everybody scattered. And it was only, it's like these it's programs are, it's like once you start and you get to know things, it's different, the whole thing's different, you know, I mean, the Beauty and the Bees programme, it was too obvious, I agree, but the, the guy, and is it Anna? Yeah, yeah. Adam. That, that Adam. moved me. I thought that was to the point. It made me feel like... Again, but that I didn't was feel showing sorry, I felt like I was learning But you something. see, the second programme for me was a chap that was perfectly healthy until a, a freak accident, where mm. the other first programme, people were born like this and had to deal with it all their lives. I think it's a good so idea to do it so that the, the ones who Botox and plump realise that, you know, even as much as you do that, one day you are going to be old and you're not going to be that attractive anymore. But the thing These is, people they're have still going to carry on birth. doing it for the could rest I, of their Can I just go back to Alison here? Um, I don't know if any of you watched the wonderful series Born to be Different, which came, which returned last night, which for anyone who didn't cry while watching that, you're obviously hardened producers. But um, <laughs> this is a, for those who don't know, this is a series which I think Channel 4 is documenting the lives of, is it 10 disabled? Six. Six disabled children from Over birth. Over 10 years. Over 10 it. years. And it's a very insightful and rather a managed, a more subtle look at disability compared to these programs. Um, and it actually involves the children articulating their condition and how they want to be accepted at equals in society. Alison, could you give a little view, overview of it just for the audience? Yeah, it, I mean, I think the uh, nice thing about it is the way it's changed from the perspective of the families, from, because it follows right from birth, so, and, and some before birth, uh, where some of them discover that the baby they're carrying is, has a disability and you go through that process with them. And so as each, it's gone out um, two or three episodes every other year following their lives. And the children have obviously become more um, eloquent and um, more uh, self-knowing about their disability. And that, I think, is uh, particularly last night's show. Mm. We had a young girl talking about dealing with incont incontinence at um, in a way that you, you I mean, I don't think I've ever seen a, an adult contributor speak like that um, so openly and without embarrassment. Um, and it's a real revelation. And it's one of those series that's kind of quite traditional in the way it's been done. But it, it brings an audience um, purely, I think, on the strength of the program making and the fabulous characters. 
um, you know, but you, you the, really you get into their over lives. 10 years. Yeah. It's a st- you're reading that story, you're seeing the story. Yeah. And I sometimes feel putting a show like Beauty and the Beast together, it's like, you know, do we really need these, these pathetic excuses of, of Playboy bunnies to actually get to know the other characters in the show that deal with the disabilities that they deal with? And sometimes it is more of a, more mm. of a entertaining show rather than a factual document. Well, it, it raises more than, than Katie, my beautiful friend, mm. which is interesting. I mean, it, that may have been to do with the fact that they were scheduled rather close together. Yeah. It might have been disfigurement, <laughs> um, overkill. <Mums. laughs> but, um, uh, you know, I mean, the, it's, I think it's fair to do different programmes for different times as well. You know, Beauty and the Beast was an eight o'clock show, and it was sort of, they did set out to make a programme about body image and try and tackle, you know, the obsessions that we have with changing the way we look and use the kind of con- slightly contrived addition of the uh, people with disfigurement. But the idea came out of having a, um, Adam Pearson working on work experience with the production company. And <coughs> so I think that's a kind of good example of you, if you get some people with disabilities behind the camera, sometimes mm. interesting ideas come out. Come out of it. Um, Could I also raise a question? A number of you have raised the issue of casting across all the programmes we've talked about. Now, is it me or is it becoming more prevalent nowadays that characters are chosen not for who they are, but how well they perform on camera? Absolutely. I think oh, that... Go on. Oh, sorry. No, you. Um, <laughs> no, you. I can't remember. I remember when cast, casting Jeopardy story arc all came in at the same time. I think we're talking 15, 20 years ago. And um, I'm, st- I'm sounding overly like a Jeremiah. I like entertaining television. I try and make it as well. But you suddenly thought, hang on a minute, is this drama or is this documentary? And suddenly we're being all asked to do casting and what's your jeopardy and what's the story arc? When it was much more kind of instinctive, you knew you wanted to make a film that people would stick with, so it had a story. But it, it became much more knowing. And I think that, OK, it's just terms that are being used but I think that something that I have noticed which um, I can remember a time a very good friend of mine filmmaker was filming somebody who was describing something uh, abuse a horrible abuse story but of course now you can't sell a documentary without a taste to take uh, something which I actually think is pretty heinous really so we went to film with this person who's telling their very emotional story and it's a real thing to tell your story on camera I mean often people find it therapeutic in the end, to, but they do it because they want to put it out on television because they probably want to help people who've suffered what they did. So anyway, this person was filmed, and I remember seeing the edit, and then it was taken up, and the commissioner said, ah, you know, they're not really compelling. And in the end, it's like a casting couch through the video camera, and uh, we can all understand why, because we're in a competitive business, and we're trying to get people to watch, and it would be facile to pretend we're not. But somebody was put through the slightly agonizing experience of doing that without the actual chance of getting it out there and getting the satisfaction that you're sharing your experience with people. And I do think that's a danger. We're now in a very competitive business. Documentaries are seen as entertainment, as feeding the ratings. And yeah, you know, we do manage to make some great stuff, Born to Be Different, you know, being one of them. I just think we have to acknowledge that there are costs to what we do. And if we're not honest about that, we're not honest about our job.